two are, y'all, they are just a bundle of fun, and we love them so dearly. We do. Sir, can you give me my coffee? Oh, you, yeah. we're, we're rearranging your... So much that he'll take his coffee back. No, okay. <laughs> I mean, we're close, but I'm not going to share my coffee. <laughs> so I just, I intro, y'all have three amazing kids. Uh, you pastor a life-giving church called Substance Church. You have four campuses. Now, I will say this about Minneapolis. Minneapolis is one of my favorite. How many of y'all been to Minneapolis? Come on, the spring and the summers are beautiful. There's like then- seven that have seven. <laughs> fall is magical. They're like, we like the heat. We fall. like it hot. Yeah, yeah. We're like, if it's not 117, I don't want to be there. Um, <laughs> but fall, uh, it starts like, you're like, okay, this could get tricky. And then winter, 30 below. Yeah, it could drop 50 degrees within the next two weeks, nine, you guys. Nine feet of snow is very typical. Which is why we don't go there. We bring them here. Do you guys see? I'm just... Practically Canadians, you know. Yeah. Like <laughs> we were used to it. But so, so you're author of two books, yep. uh, which is amazing. Uh, I also got, it's funny, the, our team does some recon, and they were like, you know, he started out as a DJ. Mm. Uh, I started out, but I'm st- I still have the skills to pay the bills, everybody. Wow, okay. I, for real, for real. No, actually, I gave my life to Christ in a nightclub while DJing. Wow. Yeah, so it's kind of like, and I, so. 31 years ago. Oh, uh, and that was old school. I'm talking vinyl. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can spend on my new uh, CDJs, but I, I just, for real, though, I, I, right when I started dating this lady, I was so depressed one night in a nightclub. I had a Christian friend try to talk me into Christianity, and I was not very interested. And yet, you know, life has a way of leading you to God, doesn't it? I mean, I was just so depressed. I uh, was looking on the, the the dance floor, and I remember thinking, at the time, I was really spiraling. What was the song? Like, we need context. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Oh, see, I didn't spin the classics. <laughs> okay. I was progressive was like- house. Okay. So yeah, but but like two fifty two, right? No. no, you're you're thinking you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> never mind. We're just gonna we're gonna He's move gonna on. He's gonna skip there. that one. We're gonna move on. No, but for real, I I uh, I was so depressed. I literally was like, God, whoever you are, whatever you are, if you created the universe, then you should be powerful enough to show me what religion is the right religion. I literally prayed that. Oh. While in the DJ booth, and then I remember kind of snapping out of it, like, what are you doing? You're praying. Like, what are you doing? And I, then, what's yes, happening? Yes, yes. Just, I got it, just so everybody's aware. Yes. And you have to know, he didn't know how to pray, so he didn't know, like, where to look, didn't know how to close the prayer, didn't know how to say, sure. in Jesus' I was like, name, and amen. done. <laughs> you know, like, and then I, I literally was like, I need a smoke break. Just being no filter, okay? Right. No, no filter. filters. No, no filters. Filter. And I, I, so I started walking out of the club. I'm only 30 seconds away from that prayer, and a guy came up and shared Christ with me out of nowhere. Like, I had just prayed this prayer. And then in a nightclub, this, I mean, it so freaked me out. Wow. I love what he said. He said, I know this is strange, but I feel like I'm supposed to tell you Jesus has a plan for your life and he wants you to follow him. That's incredible. Wow. And that guy is right, actually sitting right over here. <laughs> he's not, he's not here. We he's couldn't, not. we couldn't figure out how to get him here, but keep well, going. I, so I, I literally was scared. Okay. I don't know if you've ever had like a, an answer to prayer that was so undeniable that it freaked you out. But I I was scared. Immediately, I'm like, oh, no, I have to do whatever this guy said. I just literally asked God to reveal himself to me, and and he did. And and so I'm like, I literally was like, tell me what I'm supposed to do. And he gave me a a one-minute awkward repentance uh, explanation, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. (laughs) And so he, he grabbed me by my hands, pulled me down into a booth, and I repeated an old school prayer after him. And I'll never forget, I got off, I was done at the club around 2 a.m. I was going to visit her. She was working the night shift at a hotel. And I was like, you'll never believe what I did tonight. This is like at 3 in the morning. And she's like, what? I'm like, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm going to church tomorrow morning. And I'll never forget, she like pulled the cigarette out of her mouth and she goes, you did what? (laughs) This is definitely no filters and I'm loving it. Yeah, well, she, and then, Get this. Oh, my gosh. This is the twist. I go to church with this guy the next day. Everyone at the church somehow knew I was dating this girl named Carolyn because she led half of the people to Christ at that church, and I didn't even know it because 
Her life was a little bit of a mess. I grew up in church. I literally was born and pretty much filled with the Holy Spirit in my mother's womb. So I'd been on 19 mission trips by the time I was 13. You know, so like I was just that. I loved Jesus, read my Bible, grew up in church. But then when I was 16, my, my dad committed suicide and had no idea he struggled with mental health, mental illness. He was a strong Christian. And literally at my dad's funeral, Peter and I started dating. Talk about dysfunctional. I would not recommend that. Um, you know, really healthy. We go to the funeral and we go to the coffee shop and start smoking a lot. And so anyway, um, all that to say, I'm, I stopped going to church. I'm in a confused state. I start dating this unchurched heathen and, uh, and my old youth group that I was a leader at was praying intensely for me. Wow. And so we talk about really Peter's salvation experience was a result of the church praying for me. I'm the collateral blessing because she was hanging out with... <laughs> Because everybody at the church was talking about this horrible guy that Carolyn Kirkpatrick is dating named Peter Haas. And so that when I, when I realized, oh my gosh, this is my mission, to get her to come back to church. And it took me three whole months uh, to get her to come back. I had a lot of pride, and I knew Christians, and I knew they were going to be like, Carolyn, we've been praying for you. And I just was like, I don't want to hear that. But I'm telling you, it just took one church service. It just took one worship song, okay. the presence of God. Let's it was go. like, I give up, I surrender, I miss you, God, I yeah. need you. I went from having the most clarity in my life, and the minute I stepped out of church and out of the presence of God, I was the most confused human. The minute I stepped back into church, into relationship with God, into surrender, it was like clarity, peace, so good. hope. Yeah. And we're going to be talking today, but I want to say one thing real quick. There's a couple little things that I feel like the Holy Spirit just kind of put a magnifying glass on for me. I love that you had people, I need somebody to hear this, praying for you. Yeah. Because sometimes when we pray these prayers, we're like, God, do you even hear them? Yeah. Like, are they just fleeting? Are they just flippant? Are, are they just mist that just float away? But there were seeds being planted in the spirit realm yeah. while you were chain smoking Virginia Slims. I was talking to I Peter. Yeah. Um, yes. Those long cigarettes, I'm sure. But prayer works, y'all. If you're believing God for a breakthrough in a family member, a daughter, a son, a, a spouse, a loved one, pray. The thing that we love, well, we love so many things about these two, but one of the things that we love so much about them is this testimony of where they came from, because the first thing you heard us tell you about them is how many locations they have. They're incredible pastors. They've got these children that are serving the Lord, yep. but sometimes we don't always get to see the full picture of where they came from and where they started and how God got them to here. So what we're talking about today is growing in faith as a family. So good. And maybe you're not, um, maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you're not in that season yet. But the wonderful thing about the wisdom that these two have, from where they came from, and what they're going to impart, is that if you are not yet in a family of marriage, you can hold on this to this for the future. Yeah, and maybe great. you can use it for the family that is not the marital family that yeah. you just were born into. But the amazing thing about this is that there are so many nuggets that you'll be able to hold on to. So one of the first things that we want to ask them is that they are these amazing pastors. They do have this wonderful family. So what would you, what would you encourage? How would you tell us to, that you guys have been able to grow personally in your faith, um, as a couple in your faith in this season of life, and with your children? And you can tie that back to your testimony where it began or however you want to. Well, you know what's funny is, is God never wastes our pain. And you need to understand that, nor will he waste your past. In fact, actually, it's funny how God will always use your pain and your past to, to, to build a future platform, a future testimony. The, the ironic thing is, um, even after I became a pastor, I ended up going back into electronic dance music and writing a lot of music. And it's funny how none of those, those passions in my life have been wasted. In fact, actually, what's hilarious is I, I tour with my uh, my oldest daughter. I ended up teaching her DJing, and then she's really good at songwriting too. So then we produce uh, we produce electronic dance music, and we toured as far away as London um, with our turntables. That's and, so cool. uh, and and yet it's ministry. Okay, so like I, I'm just I'm telling you, whatever your freakish story is. God has really fun things, and it's funny to watch just how the Lord has even kind of redeemed the two of us. We, we ended up going into ministry, 
And then ultimately, we got married. Uh, we've been dating 31 years. Got married this December. It'll be 28 years. So we got married at 20. I mean, like we were babies. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we weren't hadn't even graduated college yet. Got married. Went into ministry together. Started pastoring immediately. And I think it's important to know some of our context because um, within two years of becoming you know, pastors in central Wisconsin, our mentor, our lead pastor had a moral failure. And it so shook us and rocked us because he taught on marriage and then he was caught having a 10 month affair and he wasn't repentant. It it was devastating. And it kind of shook us like, oh my, okay, if he, what the heck, how, what are we going to do different? And so I am telling you that radical devastation that we experienced early on as pastors completely changed how we, our marriage, then when we had kids, how we parent, how we pastor, how we do church. You know what I mean? So and practically speaking, you want to know how it changed is, you know, I, I was brought in really because my background is music producing. I was brought in to do worship a lot of times. Right. And so we were great at the show. We were great at the Sunday morning stage, but you know what? I knew that in my own life, I had dark closets that I needed to clean out. And when I watched my mentor have that experience, I realized, you know what? Um, Enough of Sunday morning church and a lot more of Monday through Saturday, confession of sin, authenticity, small groups. And and I, I, so like, I, I made it my goal I never want to go more than a couple days without confessing my sin, just bringing everything I am, everything I'm struggling with into the light. And that meant sexual purity. That meant, you know, physical wholeness, emotional wholeness, mental health. Like really, James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. I wonder how many people aren't healed because they don't have confession of sin. They're just church service attendees. Good, man. And, And like our family saw that. They saw, you know what, what real church is, is having a good group of friends who, you know, like Luke 5, right? The, 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 there's the story where the, 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 there was a paralytic man, and they ripped through a roof yep. to lower a paralytic man in front of Jesus. And I, when I read that story in Luke 5, I thought, you know what, that is what biblical church is. Do you have friends who would rip through a roof for you? Because if you don't, then for all practical purposes, you're an unchurched Christian. That is literally the definition of what it means to be churched. Do you have friends that will go crazy out of their way to see you healed and whole? And I knew at that That's moment good. in my life, I needed more of that. And so to be honest, that was it was like organic church. We wanted to train our kids, hey, it's normal to confess your sin. It's normal to have a small group. It's normal to, to, like, yeah, we attend a, a Sunday service, right. but that's really just one tiny aspect yep. of it. Yep. And so for my kids to, to grow up knowing their dad gets together with a bunch of guys every Tuesday night, confesses his sin, gets prayer for his issues, and they know that. You know what I'm saying? We, we talk about how our church is large enough across all of our campuses to serve a city but our groups, by the way, if you're not in a group or in our fall semester, how many of y'all are in freedom groups right now? Come on, make some noise for the freedom. We talk about how our groups make us small enough to know each other, and we preach this a lot, that you need to have somebody pouring into you beyond what you're hearing from the stage. You need to have mentors and people in your life that are pouring into you, people that you're pouring into, and the brothers and sisters who are standing alongside of you. That's Proverbs 27, 17. That's iron sharpening Iron, that's transparency, that's honesty, and it's accountability. There's a lot of people walking around, like, afraid, if, well, but if they knew the real me, which is why we're talking about no filters. You should be able to have a conversation and have somebody in your life that can check you before you wreck yourself. And that's what that confessing of sins means, because sometimes we get a little lost in that, like, wait, did that, is he, did he mean I have to go to a priest? No, no, it just means being able to say to someone trusted, this is what I'm dealing with, pray with me, stand with me, agree with me in faith so that I can grow stronger. So good. Well, in fact, get this, I actually found a study where they, they, they surveyed how many people, how many Christians have experienced an undeniable miracle in their life at some point. 
And they found that by and large, the people who had the greatest number of miracles also had the highest frequency of Christian friends in their life at any given moment. They found that that Christians who merely attended a service had the least amount of miraculous in their life compared to people that had the highest number of intimate Christian friends. And so we, we made it our goal from day one, all of our kids are gonna be involved in a ministry on a weekly basis, right? and they're gonna have a weekly small group. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, it, that was like values for us that we wanted to make sure. In fact, actually, did you know that Christians who have a weekly ministry in a local church rate themselves seven times happier than Christians who do not? I mean, think about that, okay? So like from, from the time our, so like when we planted our church um, back in the day, our, we had two little girls at the time, and then we hadn't yet had our, our boy, okay? So, our, we, so we have three kids. Our, our oldest is 22, our second daughter is 20, and we have a 17-year-old son, and so we're about to empty nest, baby. Mm. Okay, all right. Take it easy. I have to put you guys here on the chairs. Can I just say, though, there is nothing greater. Like, I loved every season of parenting. I, I really did. Like, I love being a mom. I love um, being married. I love being a pastor. Like, I, and to me, you know, marriage ministry and motherhood do not compete. Um, you can, they, they look different in each season, but... I'm just telling you, there's nothing like having kids that love Jesus, that love the Bible, that love us, and that love his church. Like, there's nothing greater. And I feel like if I could give anyone hope, if, you're, if you've got little kids here today, um, do not give up, do not grow weary, be faithful in the little things, get them in church every week, get them in small groups, you get in small groups, you get in church, do you know what I mean? And, and just stay faithful because I'm telling you the long game. It's all about the long game. It is all, it's not about your career, it is about the long game of your kids loving Jesus, your grandkids loving Jesus, your great grandkids loving Jesus. That's how we're gonna change the world. In yeah. fact, you, you, brought up, you brought up my books. Okay, now, I, the reason why I bring up my books in this moment is because you know, I thought when I was younger that success would somehow satisfy me. But you know what? There is not a single professional success that I've had in my life that even comes close to the joy of having kids that love the Lord. I would trade wow. all of that. I don't care. Like, yeah, so I had a bestseller, but it really doesn't even matter to me because the most joyful moment of my life was watching my daughter DJ in front of 7,000 people. You know what I mean? Like, that was awesome, watching her light up the crowd with the gifts that God has given her. And I'm just, I'm just telling you guys, if you have to turn your professional goals, your, turn your, your, your three to five year professional goals into 10 years and just focus on the family. And ultimately, you're gonna, you're gonna be so glad when you look back because now, now, like our oldest just got married and, you know, we got to, you know, adopt another son. I mean, how cool is that, That's right? Nice. So, but, but it's so fun to watch them right now. They're back home, you know, leading worship at one of our campuses. And you guys, the joy yeah. that I, like watching them love the Lord, love his word, love his church, it's, yeah. it's priceless. What would you say would be the most practical tool that you would give being on the other side of having mostly grown children that really do love the Lord? What would be the most um, practical tool that you were able to utilize to be able to help develop their faith? That's a great question. I think the easiest, most practical is family dinner. Like we do awesome. not compromise family dinner That's like cool. every night, like every night family dinner. And, and so that meant our kids, we did not say yes to a lot of music lessons, sports, dance, you name it, you know, educational robotics. You can go through the whole spectrum of school activities. Um, if it compromised with dinner, we did not. One time our daughter was in the swim team and they did a pasta meal and we we're like, nope, you're, we're gonna have our own pasta meal, but you don't need to be with 25 total strangers eating pasta in someone else's home. It is family dinner. And it's so good. the reason why I say that is because at family dinner, and I'm telling you, our family dinners are feisty. My kids are feisty. And I'm like the peacemaker. And so I'm literally the referee of like, you fight. can't say that. Don't say that. Stop it. Like, I mean, they're, they're loud, they're chaotic, but we laugh 
we fight, um, we share values, so we share miracle stories. Like we constantly tell them miracle stories about all that God is doing all around the world. We even tell our kids at the dinner table um, trauma stories. We say, oh, hey, th- we would never give names and details, but we would share enough of other people's pain so that we could learn from it and talk about it as a family. We would talk about their friend's drama. Oh, so so so-and-so broke up with so-and-so. What do you think? Do you know what I mean? Like, we wouldn't lecture and rant at our kids. We would hear... Never waste a crisis. You know what I mean? I just think, and and there's so much research. Write that down. (laughs) Let me say this, though, because everything you're saying, what, what I'm hearing is it's intentionality. Yeah. Yes. Because you don't just end up drifting, and I need parents to hear this with kids that are little... And also parents that are, they're like, my teenage, they will never come to family dinner. First and foremost, y'all got to get some boundaries when it comes to these. Because you don't end up just drifting in a good direction. You have to prioritize yourself there. So we have rules at our family dinners. Like, my daughter Finlay will be like, give it up. And I'm like, all right. I hand her my phone. So (laughs) willingly, yes. So, So much so, all right. So much so that you can buy on Amazon. They're literally like these birdcage things for your phones. And you put your phones in and only one person knows the code. Because you have to be intentional. We sat the other day at breakfast. We went out to breakfast as a family. And my oldest son, he said, look at that family over there. And, And I looked over and he said, that kid's probably my age. He hasn't looked up from his phone not one time. And then we looked back over them at another time. Every single person at the table, mom, dad, daughter, they all were on their phones the entire time. Now, some of you are like, I know, that's that's a Tuesday for us. You have to be intentional because that's key. Because I guarantee you there were seeds planted in all those family dinners that are going to help pay off in the long run. But let's ask this. Here's the flip side. What do you do if you don't have that? Like, people are saying, that's great. Okay, awesome. You guys in your fun glasses and fancy beard and wonderful red hair. Uh, That's great. But, like, that is not my story. How do you speak to the heart of a family or a mom or a dad that would say, I get it, but where's some grace for me? What do I do in in the now? Well, all of our kids had a moment, a crisis moment, where I realized, ooh, I'm getting a little behind on parenting, right? I think we all have that moment, and I would dive into their world And if that meant I had to watch two hours of Baby Seals on YouTube or, you know, whatever it is your kids are doing. Baby Shark. You know, Baby baby Shark. Oh, please, Lord, I rebuke that. Uh, But I... I, But it would be Minecraft. It would be video games. Yeah, like, like for example, I made it my goal to always have two hobbies in common with each of my kids. And it takes... I love that. And it takes, let's say, it takes two hours of video games to have 10 minutes of good dad time, okay? So I'm earning dad time, right? Because at some point after two hours, okay, some of you are like, wow, that's a lot. There's a lot of dads that are like, that was a prophetic word because you enjoy video games. Keep going. But I'm saying whatever it takes to get into their world and purchase the dad time, and then I'd log that 10 minutes where I'd just say, where all of a sudden they'd come out with the big question, like, dad, what do I do about fill in the blank, this problem at school. And then I have that 10 minutes of golden parenting time. But, but like, even more than that, like, I think it's the small disciplines. Coming back to family dinner, it sounds like such a basic, a basic habit, but check this out. The National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, they did a study on families that regularly eat dinner together. Listen to what they found. Kids and teens who regularly eat dinner with their family are three times less likely to smoke pot. In fact, it cuts the risk of substance abuse in half. It lowers stress levels at the home. It significantly lowers the risk of suicide. Uh, If you eat dinner as a family, you're more likely to confide in your parents, more likely to be emotionally content, more likely to be selective about finding positive friends, more likely to get good grades, and they're more likely to say that my parents are proud of me, just from family dinner, okay? Like, and then, and then there's another study that found that the 25%, like, so 75% of Christian kids generally will walk away from the Lord in college, okay? The 25% that didn't, it, their families 
always had dinner together at least five nights a week. In fact, okay? show the slide. We have a really cool slide. Oh, yeah. There's like a slide a, that? Yeah, there's it's actually... It's called a, Hot Pockets and Conversations. <laughs> <laughs> there's like a little infographic on five different habits that the families did where their kids were the exception to the rule, the 25%. Okay, so up on the screen, you're going to see behind me, they ate dinner together. They served in a ministry together. Y'all can take a picture of it. They served in a ministry together on uh, weekly at local church. Their kids had ownership where if the, in the local church where if they didn't show up, something didn't happen, and they knew it. Okay, in other words, they were on a ministry team schedule. Like my, like let me give you an example. My son did not want to serve in ministry, but we told him you're gonna do it no matter what, right? And his school required service hours. So when your school requires service hours, it's so great. You're just like you have to. It's for your grade at school. And so we put him in the kids ministry and just said you have to. He it's was in like we didn't give them an option to brush their teeth. Right. You brush your teeth. Well, you also serve in a weekly ministry. So right there, they were given a responsibility devotions at home. In other words, they had some sort of God conversation in between church services every week. And then lastly, they had like mentors who were not their parents yep. who could also speak into their lives. Now, what was easy about this is really um, one in four are your responsibility, okay? Now, two, three, and five, the church is here to actually partner with you yeah. and make it easy for you. And the good news is, is if you can just take care of one and four, we'll help you with the other ones just by getting involved in church. And then you, your kids don't have to go through the same pain that like we went through. That's and, so good. And it's beautiful because it worked. All of our kids do love the Lord and do love the church. Why, why does all the mentors have fancy hair? I feel offended. Oh. No, where did they come up with this graph? We will, They're yeah, not creative. Not realistic. A beard. Hey, by the way, I knew your pastor back when he had hair. All right. <laughs> what is this? He was clean it's a long shaven. time ago. Not an intervention. <laughs> a long time ago. In fact, I actually, did I know you before your wife did? I barely remember I you. Maybe. Yeah, I barely remember you. Mm-hmm. It's yes. funny, I don't even know if I remember. Long, long ago. <laughs> he tries not to remember. So what I hear you saying is three things. I hear intentionality. I hear structure which is a dirty word a lot of the time in a lot of homes, but it's so necessary. And I hear heart, because when we capture the hearts of our children, we can impart the faith that they will need to develop into their callings so and good. the people that they're called to. And, and let me say this, because every relationship series, we, we deal with this. You're filtering it through different filters. So some of you are like, I am so far away from even being able to do any of this. So I hope next week applies more to me. Um, I need you to take these deposits for future opportunities to apply, but also start somewhere right now. Yeah. Ask your kids today, hey, starting tomorrow night, we're going to have family dinner. Yeah, but you don't understand, I've got friends, we're going to be... No, no, tomorrow night. How many of y'all, let's show of hands, we're a transparent church, would say, we can do better in this area. Come on, that's awesome. Thanks for your transparency. That's amazing. That's the majority of us. We are in such a microwave culture. Everything is instant gratification. Everything is have it your way. Everything is instant access. The dinner is like, what are we eating tonight? I don't know. Um, Captain Crunch, grab it. Let's get like, <laughs> let's, let's start being a little bit more intentional, a little bit more intention, but please start somewhere. Yeah. All right, question number two. Yeah. Um, you guys have persevered um, growing up. Obviously, we, if you're living, if you're breathing, you're going through something. If you haven't yet, then you will. Uh, you persevered through many trials. How have you spoken to your kids, poured faith in your kids? What kind of advice have you given your kids during the seasons and the trials of moments where you needed to persevere? It's such a great question. I think what I've liked to do is John 16, 33 says, Jesus said, in this world, you will have many trials. There's a great and precious <laughs> promise. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And so I think our response as parents to hardships and trials is a demonstration to our kids of how to respond. And so I try to normalize hardship. Like, I don't get mad at God. I don't get shocked. I don't get like, what the heck? Like, I don't have entitlement that I'm allowed to have, you know, unicorns and rainbows and the rest of my life is, you know, hopping and skipping and dancing. You know what I mean? So like, if Jesus promised hardship, but he also promised his presence, Jesus himself Ooh, is our good. peace. So the best thing I can teach my kids is to normalize 
normalize that hardships are gonna come. You're gonna have friendship changes, you're gonna have diagnosis, you're gonna have a lot of you know job loss, all of that. But guess what? You get Jesus and you get the presence of God. Yes. So when we experience pain and hardship, which so we good. have had, we've had building delays, we've had betrayals of friends, we've had thousand people leave our church, we had you know medical diagnosis for him, you know uh, rheumatoid arthritis, he had a neck injury in 2020, my son got diagnosed with epilepsy in 2020, like we, my kids have gone through ADHD, anxiety, depression, like all the mental health diagnoses, like we get it. We're human, we're real, we're in this world with you. And yet, we've taught our kids, we run to Jesus, we yes. run to his word. Yes. I've taught my kids the scriptures. We get godly pastors and friends praying for us. Yep. Yes. And then we listen for the prophetic voice of God. And so, let me just give you an example. So my son, he's 17, but when he was 14, he was diagnosed with epilepsy. And I think what's, what's been so beautiful is that, it, I don't know if you know anyone who has it. It is not a fun diagnosis. Watching someone have grand mal, tonic clonic seizures is pretty intense. And so we got people praying for us. Every time a pastor was in town, we had them pray for him. He would process with his youth pastor. He had some life-changing conversations with his youth pastor. Like literally wrestled with the fear of death. And it was his youth. I mean, we processed a ton with him. His grandparents prayed with him. But it was his conversation with his youth pastor that set him free from not being afraid of dying. And then we've had these, this prophetic guy from Scotland who has prayed over my son. And we have all the words written down. And every time my son would have a seizure, once he'd wake up, we'd sit down and we would reread any prophetic words that have been spoken over him and just spoke life and faith into him. And so I think that's just a good example of my kids have normalized. Yep, things happen but we're not mad at God, we're, we, we run to God, we get his peace, his word, and his church so in our good. lives. So good. And, and the line you said was, I think, key, we're, we're gonna grow through things, but our promise is we have his presence. Yeah. So, so good. good. Well, like, our kids have also seen, not just hardship, but they've also seen the miracles that come at the end of them. I remember there was this one season where we were pastoring, and it was, it was a non-fun season of pastoring, okay? <laughs> and we had just had we, had, we had tried, we live in a city that um, is very, very anti-church. In fact, uh, we had, we had five. You guys are so cold. Well, so we, cool. we had, yeah, it's not but just that. I don't think but if you're, if you're under freezing. 34, less than 1% go to church in Minneapolis. Sure. Wow. And, so and over, most of our city, 68% of our city is under the age of 34. So there's over 2 million unchurched people under 34 in our city alone. And we had 5 mil in the bank and couldn't spend it anywhere. Like every time we tried to buy a property, the city would stand against it for five years straight. We literally could not even buy property in our city because every city would stand against us. I was so depressed because we were like portable. We were doing, you know, portable church in four locations. It took 600 people just to do set up and tear down every week. It's literally copy and paste what we're doing. So thank you for reminding us. <laughs> but y'all, we're about to break ground. Come on, somebody. It's going to be amazing. It's a mile away. It's right over there. <laughs> Well, keep it, going. Well, okay. So in the middle of that season, we were kind of bleeding momentum and bleeding morale. And my my daughter knew I was depressed. And it's really sad when your ten year old daughter comes up to encourage you, right? Like, Daddy, don't feel sad. You know, like, and you're just like, Oh my gosh, but isn't that obvious? You know, like. And I, I I'll never forget because she she actually came up to me. So my ten year old daughter, she goes, Dad, I don't want you to feel sad. And I'm like, I'm. I know, I don't want to feel sad either. Would you pray for me? You know, like in those moments where, where I knew I'm falling short of being the leader, I just asked my kids to pray for me, right? And so uh, my daughter prayed for me, and, and literally she, she said, Daddy, I asked the Lord when he's going to give us a building. And, uh, and guess what, Dad? The Lord said, by this time next Thursday, you're going to find a building with a balcony. And I was like... <laughs> What? Like, what do you mean? Like, and she goes, well, Daddy, I just, I literally was just praying. And she goes, we were driving by one of those old buildings that we looked at. We used to do prayer walks around a lot of buildings. And uh, that um, was family night. Family night was Dairy Queen and then a prayer walk around a possible church building. I love building. that. You know? <laughs> so our kids equate Dairy Queen with prayer. It's yeah, perfect. Ice it. cream and prayer go together <laughs> in our family. So um, <laughs> it's really awesome. It's amazing. That's, that's yeah, yeah you gain a lot of weight when you intercede. But I just, <laughs> I, uh, no, but one of these buildings, it fell through. 
right? And they knew that. And so my daughter saw it and she goes, man, God, she, she said, God, would you reveal yourself to me and would you tell me when is our church substance gonna get a building? And she goes, I closed my eyes and I saw a meter go back and forth and it landed on Thursday and immediately the Lord showed me what it was gonna look like and I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, I just closed my eyes and I saw it. And she goes, it has a balcony and you're gonna find it by next Thursday. And it was so specific. This I don't know. Prophetess. I, well, like literally, I'm like, okay, true, thank you. Her name is True, like true and false. And uh, and uh, and our other daughter's named False. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> we would never do that. We're not that weird. But her name is True. Oh, no. Her name is True. <laughs> Could you imagine? Um, um, just for the comedy, just for the stories yeah, later. Da, 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 we had to do it, kids. Jokes, right? We had to. No. We had to do uh, it. No. So. I remember thinking to myself, there's, I, I have no real estate meetings planned. I, there's no building with a balcony available in our city. How is this going to happen? Like, is this, is this my daughter's overactive imagination? Like, I, I don't mean to be so skeptical, but it was just too specific. It just sounded absurd. Yeah. And so the next, like, fast forward a couple days, I'm not finding this building, and I kept, I was literally getting worried, like, is this that moment I have to sit down with my 10-year-old daughter, and like, we don't always hear from the Lord, you know, like, you know what I mean, like, I, I'm just being no filter, right, and, and that Tuesday morning, before the Thursday, I get a phone call from my finance guy, and he's like, Pastor, I totally forgot to tell you about a real estate meeting that I had planned in downtown Minneapolis, like, do you have time for this, and, and I'm like, does it have a balcony, right? Because my, you know, my daughter said, you're going to find a building with a balcony by Thursday. And, and he goes, I don't know, but just meet us in two hours in downtown and, and we'll find out. So I, I get off the phone and my daughter, True, she goes, you're looking at a building today, aren't you, daddy? <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, I, I am. And she goes, remember, the building that the Lord wants to give you has a balcony. Oh, dad, I forgot to tell you, it's covered in red. And she goes, the Lord actually said to me, your daddy will know this building is the one when he looks up and he says, wow. So remember that, dad. And I'm like, what? who? Does she have an email you? where we can like ask her questions? <laughs> like, like, it was questions so specific. For two. Well, she was so worried that I was going to look at the wrong building that she, she, when she was at school, she drew a picture of the exact building wow. that uh, the Lord showed her, okay? So uh, two hours later, I'm in downtown Minneapolis right next to our convention center, and I'm looking at a historic building that was 130 years old, okay? Built by, by Civil War contemporaries. It was like a 1,300-seater, and I'm, I'm taking pictures of it. When I came home from work, she came running up to me with the picture she drew at school that day. And I want you to see the picture that she drew. Like, she drew that. She was 10 years old. The one on the left. Some of you are like, that's, did she paint that? That's unreal. Really, that is the photo I took four hours earlier. And I kept thinking to myself, what are the odds that my 10-year-old daughter drew that curve of the balcony, and notice the color that everything is covered in, red. The, the dome, you can't see it, but the dome, it has a glass dome over the auditorium. I looked up and I go, wow. And then I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, I just said wow. I, you'll know this building is the one when you say wow. And I, I freaked out, literally, I, I called our trustee board, and I'm like, God is sovereignly working a miracle for our building. And guess what? The soonest we could get together was that Thursday. And sure enough, we decided that Thursday to go for that building. And get this. That's so cool. Get this. God gave us, like, like that same year, God gave us two buildings. Our assets jumped by $30 million supernaturally. Okay, now, now check this out. My daughters were a part of that miracle in an indispensable way. They saw us go through hardship, but they also saw us go through massive miracles. And I'm just, first off, if you've got kids that are young, don't count them out. That God wants to use them in crazy ways. If God can use my 10-year-old daughter to literally alter the spiritual DNA of our city, surely he can use your son or daughter. Wow, that's right? so good. Come on. So good. And so I, good. And, and listen, Maybe, 
You have a kid who is not living for the Lord and they're DJing in a nightclub. Wow. God can get them too. God can get them too. And I'm just saying, no matter where you're at, like God wants, God has a plan of redemption and and it's supernatural. Yes, it is. And if you're wondering if God can use your family, no matter how, listen, my family was so messed up when I became a a believer. Now all of them are participating in the gospel in a delightful way. And I just, I'm just saying, listen, it, it may not happen overnight, But I do believe it'll happen. And even for my whole family, I mean, it took about 10 years before all of us could, you know, even think straight. But I'm just saying God has used our family over and over and over and over again. And and I they're I'm, we're just getting started, right? Yeah, let's go. Amen. Amen. One thing that I love about your testimony in this, your daughter, is we have found so much that when we have given, when God has our attention, we see the miraculous in front of us. Yes. And so often that happens more with children because they are much more pure of heart and much less distracted. So don't disregard a child when they bring something to you from the heart of God because they have his attention and he has theirs in a very different way. So we have to get more focused like kids. That's amazing. Because we're supposed to have childlike faith. Yeah. Even as we grow up, things, the thing is that we have a mortgage to pay. We got car payments. We have a lot of things that are contending for our attention, but God wants us to approach him with that type of purity. I think that's great. Can we just one more time celebrate that story? Yeah. Incredible. Love that. I want to ask you. Now, there are kids to... that will manipulate it. Be like, the Lord told me that you're supposed to give me, uh, you know, a new, yeah, a new iPhone like day, a new iPhone. Sure, yeah, the sure. New one. We're not so, talking about that. And then we have to just pray that rebellion out that, of them. I call that prophylion. Okay, I see it. There's prophesying yes. and the there's prophylion. Uh, the okay. <laughs> one last question that we really want you to answer is: What would you say to the single person? that has a differing faith from their significant other. 90 seconds. I say get her, just, I'll tell you what, God has a plan in that, okay? Now, obviously, 2 Corinthians 6.14 actually says don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Right. And, and, and it's not meant to be oppressive. It's actually meant to set people free, right. saying, hey, don't miss out on the miracles that God wants to do in your life and when you don't have a household of faith. And so obviously if you're, if you're dating someone who's not a believer, um, like to be honest, you should, she shouldn't have been dating me. I was actually bringing her down. Thankfully, I had a heart. Thankfully, the Lord had a redemption story in my life. I always tell people, hey, listen, um, look for a, find your spouse in church, in ministry, okay? Like I told my daughters, if they don't have four to seven friends in a weekly ministry in a local church, don't date them. Like, and, and, but let's say you're married to someone and they're not a believer. Well, the, the Bible also says, 1 Corinthians 7, 12, that, hey, just invest into that relationship. Drag them to church. Because you're into that covenant. You're already in a covenant. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I believe God can do redemptive things through that as well. I mean, either way, his plan is good. It's more of an issue of just pulling people into this resource called the church because planted in the house of the Lord, you will will flourish. flourish. And so it's good. I think, real quick, one of the reasons why people settle for someone who does not have equal faith is they believe the lie and the myth that there isn't someone out there. And I think part of it is because they haven't seen it maybe demonstrated for them. They haven't seen enough healthy, life-giving, awesome marriages out there. And so therefore they're like, this is as good as it's gonna get. And, or they, they just believe there's no good person that's good looking and loves Jesus. So they just think I've gotta go to the clubs and find somebody. And so I'm just telling you, if, if, I, if there's anything you could get from us and from these guys, we adore each other. We love each other. We spur each other on. I don't have to babysit him and say, did you read your Bible? Do you love Jesus? Like, he's a big boy. He reads his Bible and loves Jesus. I read my Bible and I love Jesus. And together, we're on mission. And that's what I want for you guys. Yeah. I love that. So good. We talk about how if you're in a relationship, now, the marriage component, because of covenant, uh, man, get into a group. Get counseling. Counseling is not a dirty word. Like, connect with the house of God so that we can walk with you. But if you're in a relationship and you're dating and that relationship is pulling you away from God, it's probably not from God. Yeah. Girl, I'm just not into religion. Well, I'm not into you because I go to church yeah. and I read my Bible and I walk with the Lord. 
Yeah. And then the waiting season of being single and secure, the waiting season is not a wasted season. Right. Um, because God wants to download and give you tools and weaponry, and he wants to set you up to be the mighty man of valor or the Proverbs 31 woman that he's called you to be. Yeah. So get your own house and life in order in yeah. your relationship so that you can be trusted yeah. with what's next. Carolyn, one final encouragement for how to fully trust in him. What's one thing you would tell them? I love the scripture, Psalm 62, one. David said, my soul finds rest in God alone. And I just wanna encourage you, the world is telling you, you, find rest over here in your career, in your relationships, in your possessions, in your accomplishments. Find rest. My soul finds rest in God alone. I'm telling you, he is your provider. He's your heavenly father. And you just surrender to him. He is gonna surprise you, like laugh out loud, spoil you as your heavenly father. And that's my prayer for you today. So good. Pastor Peter. I, there's so many miracles that God wants to bring into our lives. He wants all of us to have those undeniable miracles. Don't, don't, don't settle, okay? Some of you, you, you have loved ones that you think are beyond the saving grace of the Lord. They're not. Some of you, you're thinking that the Lord is slow to work on your dreams. Listen, there's, there's not a single dream in my life that happened in the timeline that I wanted it. But you know what? When it did happen, it was better than I expected. And so just don't quit on God today for your family, for anything. Don't, don't quit on God today. Just, just be willing to walk with him through the fire and watch what he does. Because it's going to be a good, a good miracle because he's a good shepherd. So good. so good. That's so good. Would you pray for us? Would you pray for us as we, just a prayer of blessing. This room, our other campuses, just yeah. speak a blessing. Father, I just pray for every single person watching this message, experiencing your presence in this moment. And I just pray that you would meet them where they are at. God, you know the burdens that they're carrying. You know the things that are stressing them out. And yet you have called us to surrender those burdens to you and experience you. And we just acknowledge, God, that there is no circumstantial happiness. There's only joy in you. And so we want to receive you into these areas of our lives today, yes, your life, your love, so full in this moment that, that even our circumstances, though they not, may not be perfect, Lord, but we're going to feel perfect joy in the midst of imperfect circumstances. We receive your life. We receive forgiveness for our sins. And we just receive clarity for our futures and our families right here, right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Do you agree with that prayer? Say amen. amen. Come on, amen. Can we honor Pastor yes. Peter, Pastor Carolyn today? Come on, were y'all encouraged today? We love y'all. Love it. Now before we transition this service. Can you just close your eyes for just a moment across all of our locations one more time? If you're here today and you would say, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Jackie, here's the reality. Man, I needed encouraged. I needed that word. I needed those deposits. I wanted to leave marked by his presence today, but here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. With every eye closed, just for a moment, if you're watching online at one of our other locations, just position your heart for a moment. Online, part of our H crew, our team will help you. You can just say yes to Jesus today. Our team will help you there. But if you're hearing my words today and you would say, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved He's about to write victory in your story. What it takes from us and our humanity is a moment of surrender. Maybe you're the second invitation. Maybe, maybe today's message kind of stepped on some toes and maybe you feel like I've been caught up in the prodigal life, like I have been living reckless, but today, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Jackie, I wanna rededicate my life to the Lord. I want to come back home. I want to fall back in the arms of God. I want to set the trajectory of my life in such a way that I can lead a family of faith one day or get my family back in order with faith. I'm going to count to three. We won't embarrass you across any of our campuses, but this is what we want you to do. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, or you want to rededicate your life, when I hit three, I want you to lift up your hand. God is tugging 
on hearts right now. We've seen 3,001 person commit their life to Jesus just this year at Hope City. You could be the next one. So with every eye closed, one, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, you're talking about me. Would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over. I see you. I see you. I see you. And you and you and you and you. And I see you and over here and in the back and my friend here in the blue. I see you there and there and all the way over there. I see you, my guy. So amazing. Come on, Hope City. Can we honor the 15, 16 hands that just lifted and said, I want to set my life on such a path as to commit my life to Jesus. So this is what we're gonna do. Everybody from our Hope City worship, everybody watching online, everybody in the rooms, say this out loud with us. Say, Jesus, it's me. From today on, I'm making a choice and a decision to live for you. I repent for all my sins. Here's my shame. Here's my struggles. Here's all my issues. I ask for your forgiveness today. Jesus, Thank you for trading out your life for mine and then rising again on the third day so that I could have freedom and live a life of peace and hope. From this moment on, I'm choosing you as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City.